thank you for joining us. We, we're so excited to have you here. Barbara, you are a Shakespeare and Delaware Park audience member, a dear friend of ours. What would you like to be to be called today? I, I know you're a professor, you've said you are the right. wonderful bridge between SDP and the Buffalo Maritime Center. So you're, you're just, you wear many hats. I, I do. So I've been a professor for over 45 years and for 36 of those years. My training was always in early modern literature with a special focus on Shakespeare and his contemporaries. And I've always followed the performance traditions in Shakespeare in Delaware Park. My husband and I come to the performances every single summer and are missing them a great deal now. It's so great to hear of lifelong or long-term fans of Shakespeare Hill. I'm from Buffalo, but I just moved back. And it's always so nice on these interviews to hear people's different friendships with Shakespeare and Delaware yeah. Park. And we're excited yeah. to have you bringing your classroom to this episode today. So you'll be talking with us about Shakespeare's Blue and Green World, which is discussing the maritime influence, what was going on in Shakespeare's world and how the maritime and seafair influence affected the, the everyday going abouts of Shakespeare's world. Just to get us started, can you just tell us what exactly maritime is? What does that mean? Well, I'm, I'm doing this talk in part at the prompting of a former student of mine, Brian Treziak, who's the head of the Buffalo Maritime Center. And I'm incredibly conscious that this area is a blue world of the presence of um, the, the Western New York watershed and the Great Lakes and the importance of it for our history. With Shakespeare's maritime world, most people who've studied Shakespeare in some ways are familiar with Shakespeare's, quote, green world, the world of his comedies, the world of Warwickshire, the world of the pastoral. But I want to point out that in addition to this Emerald Isle, this England, England is an island, and uh, that isolated it in many respects from the continent, kept it a cultural backwater in many people's eyes for a long time. But in Shakespeare's day, they were very conscious of their maritime setting as something special and unique that both preserved them and was increasingly giving them power for what became the British Empire. And so it's both very local um, and present in the intimate geography of the plays, but it's also extremely extensive uh, through the canon and the travels of the plays. It uh, allows us to travel imaginatively with Shakespeare and his contemporaries to a really exotic world. And that's what I'd like to introduce people to today, starting with The Midsummer's Night's Dream. If you don't mind, could you give us a little background about the importance of maritime during Shakespeare's life and the world around him? Europe still thought of itself in theory as a whole. It still tried to imagine itself as descending from the Roman and the Holy Roman Empire. And much of the poetry in this period tried to celebrate that tradition. And England, in that sense, was a frontier outpost. But what was increasingly happening in this period was that trade was being enhanced. And obviously, there were the new worlds of the Eastern and the Western Indies. Rosalind talks about that. She reads a poem in As You Like It, from the East to the Western Inns. No girl is like Rosalind. Right, so, so there was scope in that particular way. There was trade. We're on the edge of the miracle of the Dutch Renaissance and England's trading vessels and privateers were challenging the largest imperial power in this period, which was the Holy Roman Empire and Spain. So the watershed moment, usually in English history that way, is England's defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, which also gave Elizabeth a final chance to be an empress. She was no longer the girl who would never come to the throne. She was no longer the marriageable object in the global politics of the period. She was no longer 
the unlikely monarch that everybody presumed themselves to rule and that imagined that we're going to marry her off. But she was still threatened, aging, and became the virgin queen at this point because she protected her country, she appropriated the power of the now defunct Blessed Virgin Mary, the Protestant country, in the protection of her country. So England's maritime ideology was established at this period, not just through trade, but through imaginative literature. Why don't we take a look at one image? It's a picture of an entertainment that was offered to her in Herefordshire in England in the course of a progress by um, an earl. And it was this was in 1591. What he did was he trenched out an artificial lake. This is at Elvisham. And he trenched out the lake in the image of a crescent moon so that he could show her defeating the Spanish Armada. You see her on the left of the picture looking out over the crescent moon, the symbol of her Diana-like power, looking out then over a sea, over a castle, over a snail-like island, which is Spain. That specific entertainment is remembered in A Midsummer's Night's Dream, which was written, oh, three to five years later. It's remembered by Oberon when he says, that very time I saw, but thou couldst not, he's saying this to Puck, flying between the cold moon and the earth, Cupid all armed, a certain aim he took at a fair vestal throned by the West, in the image Elizabeth is in the West, and loosed his love shaft smartly from his bow as it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts. But I might see young Cupid's fiery shaft quenched in the chaste beams of the watery moon and the imperial votress passed on in maiden meditation, fancy free. So Cupid shoots his arrow at Elizabeth there. He can't strike her because she's the virgin queen. And instead, the love juice falls on a pansy and turns it into a love flower. And Puck squeezes it on the eye of the lovers, including the fairy queen, Titania, and sets all the love affairs in motion. Do you know Henry V? I think they've done it at Shakespeare and Dover Park a lot of times. The most famous version of it is the Laurence Olivier film of Henry V. Olivier was commissioned to make that film in 1944 by the British War Office because England was so besieged in World War II that the British needed to recover that sense of their own ability to move from their own integrity to reconquer territory. But if you look at Howe's invasion of France, you'll see that it actually suggests the D-Day invasions at Normandy a fair bit. I'm so hung up on the, um, the Midsummer bit that you just shared. I had no idea. That's really interesting. Shakespeare is a challenge and an education to learn. And on the other hand, it has immense popular appeal can you share with us some more examples of influences from the maritime world and current events in Shakespeare's world that we see now in his works? Why don't we go abroad a little bit? Everybody, I think, knows the Merchant of Venice. Who is the Merchant of Venice? Is it Antonio? Is it Shylock? There's the sense that everything in that kingdom of Venice that is itself built on a lagoon, on a set of pontoons, evanescent. It moves back and forth. It depends on venturing. That this is a terrific site for dramatic action. So the Merchant of Venice actually begins with Antonio's melancholy. He doesn't and since he's invested everything, he's 
fairly confident that his many investments, which go in several directions around the world, some of them are going to pay off. But Solano and Solario talking to him are, are trying to buck him up, trying to make him feel that this kind of nervous capitalist endeavor that he's engaging in is surely going to happen. They say, there were your argosies with portly sail like seniors and rich burghers on the flood, or as it were, the pageants of the sea do overpeer the petty traffickers that curtsy by them, do them reverence as they fly by with their woven wings. So they're trying to figure out how to securely finance this kind of speculation. And what they settle on in The Merchant of Venice is go find an heiress. So so they, they, they look to her as Jason's who are trying to obtain her. Uh, and she does indeed reward the young hero, Bassanio, with her hand and her cleverness. And in the courtroom scene, saves Antonio's life. And But she does so at the expense of punishing the Jewish usurer, who is the other side of this unstable financial world. So you've gone from a, a, a sense of a land-based economy to this world that is gorgeous, but can be disrupted by storms, can be taken apart in a moment. Merchant of Venice, of course, is not the only Shakespeare play that is Venetian. The other great Shakespeare Venetian play is Othello, and Othello begins in Venice. It begins with the fact that the Venetian oligarchy is is uh, threatened by the Turkish threat. It was a very real threat. The Ottoman Empire was the most powerful empire in the period. The Battle of Lepanto was fought a little bit before the play was written. And so Othello opens with Venice's need for the exotic blackamoor Othello, the successful general Othello, to defend them. And it migrates into the far east of the Mediterranean to the island of Cyprus for that defense. But it turns out, again, the culture is not just seeking to defend itself or reproduce itself through battle or conquest. It also needs to do so through successful erotic affairs, through successful sexual relations, marriages, etc. And so Othello has married a senator's daughter, Desdemona, She's described as though she was the Blessed Virgin Mary herself. Hail to thee, lady, and the grace of heaven before, behind thee, and on every hand, and wheel thee round. She's like Botticelli's famous picture of Venus coming on shore at Cyprus. A, a, a beautiful, idealized love object. But we know what happens in the course of that play. It's a tragedy. So those geopolitics in Othello are concentrated in the tremendous tragedy of this marriage and the way his ensign Iago is able to work on his paranoia, his suspicion, his sense of his own inadequacies. So it's a big, big play, but also an intensely intimate play. I think you were referencing it might have been Merchant of Venice. You're talking about how the intimacy of of his of his plots. It's it's true and, and and exactly what you were just saying. They're timeless in the sense that you know they're influenced and inspired by the world that Shakespeare was in while he was writing. But the feelings he evokes and the situations that he he writes transcend to to our modern world in the sense that the the struggles and the conflicts the characters feel, the the emotions that they're experiencing. Experiencing and even even to an extent the situations that they're in like you were saying you know if you're a sailor yeah. you understand the tumultuous um, anxiety that comes with an impending storm and it's a gift that that Shakespeare had and that continues to give in a sense thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your your insights and your your um, expertise this was something brand new that we haven't discussed yet in our series and it's proven to be incredibly insightful, enlightening. You're, you're very welcome, Grace.